Hello, everybody. Welcome to Savannah on Film with Stevie and Yatman. We're here live. Um, hello, Savannah. Hello, the world. Welcome to another fantabulous episode. It's going to be a great one. Um, and today I've got um, Stephen Yetman here uh, from Council of Dads, among many other um, wonderful things he's done in his career. We're going to talk about locations and, and just everything in the film industry. Um, I want to say uh, it's glad to be back. It was nice to have a week off and, and kind of recharge the batteries, so to speak. But I came back to this wonderful Savannah pollen season, which, oh, I love you, pollen. <laughs> so I'm rocking the uh, radio DJ voice uh, today. So anyway, uh, we are here, uh, Savannah on film. And uh, as you know, our purpose is to explore the economic and cultural impacts of the film industry in Savannah through conversations with people in the industry and related fields. We are on Savannah's number one radio station and number one talk radio voted by you, the listener. We very much appreciate that. That is uh, WRUU 107.5 FMLP Savannah Soundings Community Radio for Global I had to do it. I had to do it. Anyway, so um, let me tell you a little bit about Stephen. First off, Stephen, uh, welcome to the show. Thank you for being here. I Thanks really for the invitation, Dad. All righty. Um, I would shout out to everybody on Facebook Live who's watching now um, and who will be watching. And uh, we'll take your questions and comments there. Uh, I want to remind you that WRUU is on Twitter at WRUU1075. That's WRUU1075. And um, just a short introduction here of uh, Stephen Yetman. And uh, correct me if I say anything wrong, okay? All right. All right. Um, I'm telling you, I'm, I'm full of uh, whatever it is to get rid of pollen. <laughs> so um, anyway, we're doing fine. Um, Stephen is an experienced location manager uh, with a very deep history in working in the entertainment industry. He's skilled uh, in many things from... Music videos, which I miss music videos. Mm -hmm. I, I, I want to pick your brain on some of that. And sure. What that experience has been like. Uh, of course, feature films and um, production management, film and documentaries. Um, so you, you've had your hands in, in a little bit of everything. Um, um, he's got a strong media and communications uh, presence. Uh, he has a, a Bachelor of Science, um, focusing in business administration and management. Uh, general from the College of Charleston. We were just talking before the show um, about Charleston that you, you're you from New York. Originally from Brooklyn. Brooklyn. Right. Brooklyn in the house here. And uh, But about, what, 30 years in Charleston? Yeah, 30 plus. 30 plus, 30 plus. So um, uh, and we were talking about the differences of uh, Savannah, how Savannah's grown in Charleston being sister cities and then the Brooklyn um, how Brooklyn has changed, and um, so it's good, it's good. Um, so um, everybody may know Stephen um, for for a lot of different things. I mean, I've got a, a long list of stuff. Um, a brilliant film that, that you were a part of, Cold Mountain, in 2003, mm -hmm. that was with Nicole Kidman, is that correct? Yeah, yeah. Jude Law, the name's Jude, Elwiger. Yeah, I mean, stellar cast. Um, what was that like? Well, the interesting thing about that is there were five Academy Academy Award winners on the AXA panel. Wow. So you had three stars. So you had five of the guys that, uh, or, or people who had won. Mm -hmm. uh, costume designer, uh, Anthony Miguel is the director, who had won for The English Patient. Oh, yeah. Um, and so, and then uh, I want to say Dante Ferrari was a uh, production designer uh, who had been nominated like five or six times prior to that. He's won one since then for another mm -hmm. movie. But uh, it was quite impressive to see uh, what it's like in a in a, a, a true you know feature big time movie with a lot of money to spend. Yeah. So um, obviously it's different working television versus film, but in the way a lot of the streaming services have come up, and and even the um, you know stuff like HBO and in different places Netflix etc. Amazon, and um, it's interesting to see the quality of shows that. Now TV seems to have that cinematic production value, and um, what, what's that been like to see that change? I mean, 
you know, there, there, what I'm getting at is that there used to be a time you either did, you know, film actors would never go near television. Right. And, you know, television actors, they would want to be, you know, in Hollywood and, and on the feature films and such, but, you know, you never kind of go back, you never mix the two. And it's, it's kind of like being, back in the day, a Star Trek and a Star Wars fan. You, you couldn't be both, but I was always both. Right. And uh, so I'm glad to see that. Um, how, how's it changed over the years? Well, I, I guess, you know, the odd thing about the, the current situation is that this television as we knew it, right. growing up with three networks and maybe right. fourth and things were on. When they were on, you had to tune in then. You know, then the advent of the DVD player and VHSs so we could watch it on our own leisure. Yeah, that, that was so, like, revolutionary at the time. Sure. Because you, if you missed something, like when I was growing up, I was a kid, you missed it, you missed it. Right. You know, you might, unless the network replayed it at some other time, you missed it. Listen, even as you're watching stuff now, and all of a sudden yeah. you see, you miss something, you, all of a sudden you hit rewind, you go back to watch it. We were at the mercy of whatever the, uh, the, the networks were doing to us yeah. or allowing us to see. But, um, so... With all that, uh, how is how is technology and all that? How do you think it's is it help? How is it helping? How is it hindering? Well, I don't know that uh, we've appreciated the full transition just yet of film, leaving film, as it were, exposing film to light and creating images, mm -hmm. as opposed to what you do digitally now. Right. Um, you know, as a location manager, location scout, we went through this when we we were going from film cameras to to digital, mm -hmm. and I can remember having to do both both. Uh, both venues, uh, creating pictures and putting taping them up, and then stitching them together electronically, and having to supply these to both producers or uh, location film offices in, right. in different states. Um, and I don't think that we're there just yet because you know, digitally, um, you need less light to capture your imagery, right? right? And so I think there's still, I, I think the industry is still catching up with uh, being able to be leaner and lighter. Um, and but it's I mean, coming. Yeah, the technology, though. I mean. Even, even just, I mean, talk from the sound department is, is amazing enough. I mean, uh, cinematography and everything else, um, amazing. But, you know, it doesn't take an entire room to, to film something now. You know, it's full of equipment. Mm -hmm. You, you got to be mobile. You got to be able to move and get that extra shot here and there. And, and, yeah, technology can be our friend. And technology, I think, is never wrong. It's just how we use it. And, I agree. But, you know, it's, it's, it's amazing to see what people can do just with their iPhones. Yeah, and, and programs that you can you stitch stuff together, and it doesn't take what it used to take to, to make those. It, it doesn't take a whole studio mm -hmm. <laughs> per se to do it. Um, you can, you can do it otherwise, and um, and in the advent of technology advancing, that it's brought a lot of people in the game that may have not ever gotten a shot sure. under, under the old system. And no, and it's it's also allowed them because there is this this newness to this technology it gives mm -hmm. new people an advantage. Or an opportunity, should I say, yeah. to get in since the old guard is, is is sort of in the same spot that they are, but they've got to figure out how to how to use the new technology. True. I mean, well, we saw that with Scorsese. You know, he didn't he didn't understand that the Irishman could be watched when he made the deal with Netflix that <laughs> someone could pick their phone up and watch the Irishman, and and I agree with him to the extent that something that that he makes has to be experienced in the theater. It's it's a you know it's about the whole thing of. And, um, but I think now he, he's, he's kind of caught up to that. You know, not that he ever has to apologize for anything being a master of, of, of film um, that Martin Scorsese is, but it's, it's, it's just amazing. You know, he, he didn't think that, that, you know, it would be on this phone and this tablet. I, I didn't create it. I created it to be seen like this, not like this. You right. know? <laughs> and, and so that, that, that's very interesting. It's amazing. Um, how has location management um well you talked a little bit how that's changed um is it i won't say easier because it's about finding locations it's about getting the right location for whatever the script calls for and whatever the director's seeing and um has it has technology helped you with that has it well so the research when you try to find places mm -hmm. uh, becomes much more it's it's easier now i mean you've got all these uh, online apps for, for places that are for sale, places that are for rent. Right. Uh, you can take a Google map guy and put them on a street corner and spin them around. And, oh, that's true. You know, so there's so many things that you can do. And then, of course, you know, when you're looking for different properties, you're, you've got maps. Um, all these documents and stuff, you have to go to the county 
mm -hmm. try and find information. Oh, that's yeah. You're right. They're at your get fingertips the, now, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, you'd have to sign out this and that and get the you get the big giant book and yeah, the plot the maps and, the and all that other stuff. Oh, and I'm rolling the scroll. <laughs> try to travel from county to county, trying to figure stuff out. You go find a property, and then you go to the, go to the county office and, and and try and find the things and find the map and then find the owner and all that stuff. Now you can be done. On your phone or on your computer, you, you can amazing. do it. You can do it without even getting out of your chair. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> which is amazing. Well, it, and it helps and it hurts though. So by the same token, yeah. Anybody else that I'm working with can yeah. get out and find these things as well. They turn around and ask me questions about. This is something I wanted to ask you, um, being location manager. That do you find that everybody now thinks they're a location <laughs> manager? Uh, <laughs> be as honest as you need to be. Well, you know, everybody, everybody likes to help. And yeah. uh, like anything else, um, there's, there's, a, there's a, a, a fine line between being helpful and being too helpful. Right. Um, but that being said, you know, people try to help. And, uh, you know, as they say, sometimes there are no bad ideas. Okay. But uh, sometimes they're just ideas that need to sort of be, listen, at the end of every day, I need to find someone who's interested in having a film project at their property right. and not just finding a great property. Yeah. Right? You can show me pictures of stuff in, in, in uh, Southern Living or... That's well lit, the five million dollar home, and someone says, "What about this place?" And my first question is, "Do you, do you know the owner? Is he interested?" Right, right. Great that's places true. are great, but if I can't use them, yeah. If I drive by a place and say, "Wow, that's a beautiful house," that would be great for sure. Whatever they're trying to do, and I get on Facebook or send you a text or whatever it is, and you know, but yeah, but I don't own it. It's it's a different story. You but know? you know, but so people come into town, right, and they see great buildings, and they're they're curious as to whether or not you know they can be utilized, and it's a fair enough question. But by the same token, you know, we've got to vet that very quickly and move along if the answer is no. I don't really have much time to spend on trying to convince somebody. Do you find the pace now that technology has is so integrated in, in our lives and everything that we do, do you find that that the turn we can expect that instant turnaround? Is that is is it more stress on you to, you know, you hadn't found that location for a scene, whatever, you know. To some degree, so it's, so it's a mixed match here. Um, certainly, there's a lot of pressure because it's instantaneous. I mean, back in the, back in the day, it used to be a pager, oh, yeah. right? And you have to go find a phone, right? Make a call to find out what you know, what someone wanted to talk with the emergency was. And now, you know, you get documents driving around in your car. People forward you stuff. Plans, site plans for a place come. The phone goes on, and all this is being done just as you go through the course of your day. But other things have helped as well. You know, I can go out and take photographs immediately, send it to someone who needs to see it. Right. right. I mean, moments after I take the picture, I can send it to you. Right. Right. And I can say, oh, and, if I'm a director, I'm like, oh, yeah, it's perfect. Yeah. Or it's perfect. I, I can send video, you yeah. know, and these things you couldn't do before. Right. Um, so it, it's kind of cut both ways. Um, but it is challenging. The pace is, uh, is very quick, especially in episodic. I don't think people understand that um, seven days before I go to camera on a show, I meet the director. <laughs> I, meet, yeah, I meet him, right? And so within two or three days, he picks a place, and three, four days after that, I may have to be filming somewhere. Um, so it's uh, it's quite challenging. Uh, it's not for the the meek of heart. I'll say that. Yeah, it's it's long. I'm sure it's long days and long nights, and it and it helps to have someone on your side at home that that understands, or you know, have a significant other, correct? Mm -hmm. That understands that lifestyle. I'm looking at your guest here in the studio, but um, but. Um, it helps to, it really does help to have someone that, that understands the film life, that understands that 12, 16 hour days are a norm, you know, you know, that, and, and they're willing to be in the long haul with you on it. I think that's. Well, it's, it's worse than that for me. I'm, my, my, I'm on call. You're, oh, that's I'm true. On, right. So I don't, uh, you know, I don't punch a clock. You don't, I was going to say, you, my, you don't My clock phone rings at four in the morning, rings at six in the morning, rings at ten at night. Uh, and with all these robocalls, it's really difficult to, to pass up a call because I don't necessarily recognize a lot of numbers. Right, and you I mean, can't block all no, of them right. because you might have blocked Martin Scorsese. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, I've got to take the call. I've got to uh, take this call. Yeah. You know, uh, but, uh, gosh, what was I going to ask? What's, what's um, probably, I, I, I don't know if you need you mentioned the name, but what was like the most challenging Thing you've uh, a project you've worked on in locations I mean like or, or one place that you were trying to lock down did you ever like what's what's the worst possible or most trying situation you can tell me about without giving away too many specifics because <laughs> I, I, I know we can't really 
say, but... Well, um, you know, so there's a thing for uh, shows that have money and shows that don't. Shows that don't have money are much more talented. They're the ones that want the most, don't they? Yeah, yeah. Yes. And, uh, right, they're paying the least, they're offering the least. Mm-hmm. And, uh, and it, yeah, it, and, and so those become the most challenging for everybody. Um, so... Do, do locations just sometimes fall in your lap? I mean, sometimes, sometimes. Yeah. yeah. Um, there's there's a great story. I was doing a uh, I think it was a print ad many years ago, and uh, the owner asked me, he said, "So how did you find my house?" I said, "That's a very interesting story." Um, <laughs> I was sent out to find uh, craftsmen, style style homes. So I found maybe a dozen right. in the downtown Charleston area, and as we got out to look at one of them, the director turned around. And said, "What about this house directly behind me?" And I turned around and looked. I said, "But that's a federal." He goes, "I know, but I like it." I like it. So, yeah. so the owner was, "Well, how'd you find?" Me? I said, "Well, fortunate enough for you, you live across the street from a craftsman." <laughs> <laughs> so they changed it just to get you know, because that, that's what the director saw. And yeah, so. and somehow fell in love with uh, you know this brick uh, federal style home in downtown Charleston, and um, that's where we ended up filming his uh, his, I mean, his project. Between Charleston and Savannah, we have such beautiful old homes with, with such history and such ambiance, and and just even 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 the areas that these homes are on located on. I mean, we've got everything but mountains. True, but we can see the right places. <laughs> we can green screen those in, right? These days um, we can. Yeah, these days. Um, how would you? Let's. Have you ever had a situation where there was like a place that you needed that was, you saw the house, but. You were like, it's in the wrong place. You, do you know what I mean by, you know, it's like the right type of house, but mm-hmm. it's in the totally wrong location. It's like at the beach. And you really need it to be like a prairie scene or something like, what, what would you do in the old days versus, well, now with green screen? I would think the old days, you just keep looking. You just keep looking? Yeah. Okay. yeah there's, there's no way to, there's no way to, to, to fix it. Well, there's pro- I don't know. <laughs> well, it, I'm sure there would have been a way whether or not it was cost effective became the, the, the point. It is. It is about the the mighty dollar. Yeah, at the end know, of the day. Yeah. At the end of the day, because you want you want to make the the, the most tight. You're on the tightest budgets, but you want to you want to get the best return for for your dollar, and that's just good business sense. Um, I want to talk about music videos, just mm-hmm. because I love music videos. I miss music videos. What was your experience like working with music videos? So they were they were always fun. Uh, they were short term projects, obviously. Um, but and, and, and I don't mean to interrupt you. I'm sorry. Uh, but how far back? Uh, oh, you're talking about uh, what 80s and 90s? Okay, and, yeah. and then it's Probably kind of heyday. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Uh, Edward McCain video, Indigo oh, yeah. Girls. Oh yeah. Uh, but but it's interesting. So you go out and you're you're still trying to tell a story, mm-hmm. in a much shorter uh, time span, and uh, it's going just you know collecting imagery, and uh, it's like anything else. So once the editing process is put together, it's it's kind of great how you can see people just capture these things and then and then the singers are singing and doing a little playing and all that. But there was a story behind them all. What was one of your favorite? Can you say what one of your favorites was? Or? Well, I, I really liked, um, it was an Ed McCain video. I'll um, be? No, it was, it was earlier than that. Okay, well, that was before. That. Um, was, uh, it's the story about, uh, um, about his mother sending him away. Oh, I know what you're talking about. Because uh, they, they, because they hit when Hootie and the Blowfish was. Yeah, yeah, and, and actually, I think, I, I think. I saw uh, it here in Savannah. In fact. Yeah, I think Darius walks out in his video and, um, and, and is singing. And, and, I, I know the song. Wow, it's in my head. Yeah, I'm gonna be, I'm gonna be probably hitting up Spotify <laughs> later for it. Um, yeah, but it, it, I, it was kind of what that mid '90s. I think. Mm-hmm. So, so what's what's the story about? So um, I, I guess you know I, I'm not quite sure what Edmund's story was, but mm-hmm. uh, but uh, somehow the, the family was breaking up, and the mother was troubled with what he was doing, and and uh, she sent him away as opposed to dealing with his problem, you know, which was their problem really, right. you know, um, and that he he had a nice group of guys. His band was nice, and uh, I want to say we went into an old theater in downtown Charleston as well for music portion of it, and that's where. Uh, in 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 the video, Darius comes out and and, and uh, right. sings along with him. Yeah, he's yeah. Got a little bit of backing. Mm-hmm. Wow, you just took me back. I, mm-hmm. I like that because I'm a big music buff and and uh, Hootie's awesome. Uh, but yeah, um, hmm. So uh, what other uh, videos? Um, what's been? Well, you, I don't want you to say the name or whatever. But what was like the worst experience? I mean, why is more the question? Like, 
what was, if you're like, oh, dear Lord, please get me out of no, here. No, I, I don't mind answering that question. Um, I was working on a pilot, and, um, you know, it didn't have any sort of redeeming storyline. Mm -hmm. um, and directors and producers demanding that you find them all this great stuff. Someone showed me a picture of the Biltmore and said, find me something like that. <laughs> <laughs> right. That's hard to do. Right. So I just kind of laughed. I said, you understand that, you know, the South was made with, you know, old South money, wasn't industrial, wasn't the railroad, wasn't steel. I don't right? want to hear it. I want that. <laughs> All right. I want the bill. I want something like the bill. Yeah. The bill was 175,000 square feet. Yeah. You know, you might find a mansion around here, 15,000. Maybe a little bit more, mm -hmm. right? But the Biltmore's garage is seventeen thousand square feet. Oh my gosh! Right. <laughs> so you know, and then of course the storyline isn't so great, and, and and unlike you know the project I'm currently working on and some others where it's got a good storyline, right? You know, so who you know why does someone who owns this fabulous house that says I have as as much money as you could have in South Carolina or Georgia, why would they want to be involved in this particular project? There's no storyline to it. It hasn't built some sort of reputable cause or something like that well i can remember and 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 i was obviously younger at the time but um i'm, I'm of that what they probably call mtv generation mm -hmm. you know? and uh, so we grew up on this the visual right and, you know I'm, I'm still very much a visual person and um i can remember when tv changed and especially when we got into like i want to say definitely the mid 80s everything was that cut shot everything was did you do you find that that and maybe even in TV? I mean, because because it, it was it, for a while it got really bad. You know, you, you didn't have like a couple seconds before there was another camera, another camera. No, you know, mm -hmm. was it more um, location wise and and um, did did it challenge you more back then? Doing no, I mean, because so, all all that is through the process, right? So they right. find stuff and 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 the way they shoot it really doesn't affect what I necessarily. You know, hmm. um, you put them someplace and, and, and allow them to go do their thing. Yeah, yeah. Put, put, put three or four cameras on them <laughs> and all of that and, and capture it. Um, so, um, hmm. what, uh, hmm. I'm trying to think, I'm trying to think here. You've done reality television. Just barely. Barely. Yeah, I don't think I've ever location managed a reality show. You, you haven't? I don't think so. I've, I've done some work in the art department. Because they were all real. <laughs> right? <laughs> Everything well, they're really photographed. They're really photographed. <laughs> um, what about documentaries? I mean, those those are a different sort. Those sure. Are, those are those can be deep. They they can be very rewarding to work on, I, I, would, I would imagine. Yeah, smaller group. Uh, generally nicer. Uh, easy to get along with. They're, they're not, I don't think they're, they're uh, pushed by the pressure that you get from from other projects. Now, I'm not saying there was a pressure on them, right? But it doesn't. It's not the urgency that there's a due date. It's got to be done in a certain amount of days. Um, and generally, as you know, if you're doing a documentary, it's got a good story that you're right. you're following. People are generally more likely to try and work with you. Yeah, yeah, because you you got that singular purpose. It's almost like it's a more laser focused. What what you have to get each each day on the shoot mm -hmm. from that and. Um, and uh, I, I just I think that documentaries are just so I mean, it's so much visual storytelling, and um, but very fascinating because because there's so much they seem more to me more focused and more um, I guess that's what I'm trying to say. <laughs> so um, anyway, um, we are talking today here on Spain All Film with Stephen Yetman and. Uh, where can people find you if they're interested in, in checking out some of your stuff? Well, I'm on IMDb. Okay. Um, Stevie with the T H Y E T M A N, and then I do have uh, a, a, a listing on LinkedIn. And what I use those for is that I'm you know I'm I'm not really much into self promotion that kind of stuff. But so when I come knocking on your door, mm -hmm. and someone's trying to figure out whether or not I'm a scammer, or whether or not I'm legitimate, these two things have made it so that people can get online and. And figure out not not just and they're legitimate phone. sources so that you can protect your reputation. Correct. Or, or if yeah. someone's just going, you know, should I let this person on my property to take photographs? So every time someone walks into my yard, <laughs> I'm going to go like <laughs> IMDb. Sure, <laughs> but you you certainly can. Um, well, we're going to talk a little bit about uh, Cancel of Dads, which uh, just wrapped filming here in Savannah. Um, I want to say our first um, series that hopefully we're going to get several seasons of.
for hope. I'm hoping it's the. I, I use this as a, 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 a guideline, but our next Frazier, mm -hmm. you know, so to speak. You sure. Know, good 10 11 season run, wouldn't that be? That would be nice. Fantastic. That would take me to retirement, I believe. And, um, so we're, we're going to um, hit some um, uh, a break here, and then we're going to come back and we're going to talk about, with Stephen Yetman about Council of Dads and some other things. So we'll be right back once in a while on film. Are you new? Savannah Science right. Programming is made possible by listeners like you and by the Audrey Clinton Savannah Music Festival. Presenting classical music artists, Bill Record Cat in the Hat, and Nancy Field, the Sun, and Andre Watts. She wants to talk about the Cat in the Hat. Well, yeah. because with the unique, how he explains things to people whose houses he owns. Is he says it's a location? Okay, so she wants to make sure that someone understands what it's going to be like. Okay, okay. Don't worry about you, 107.5. So literally, I told someone, it's like I'm letting the cat in the hat come into your house. Supported. Right. I'll just bring, I'll bring I'll a cat in the hat and let you read your station. Our diverse broadcasting and programming is supported by generous listeners. Get off of my wall. Value our passion. Well, that's the neighbor. He was going to high tech on you. I thought you were going to talk about your drone. You received no government or law. What about his house? Look at my house. You can thank you. My early American, the source of our funding. Hey everybody who's watching there, um, uh, I'm always going to fix my hair, why do I do that? Um, <laughs> we've got Stephen Yetman here. Uh, we'll be taking your questions and your comments uh, for those who are watching this and who are catching on the uh, replay. We thank you for being here, uh, Savannah on Film. And we'll be back on the air in just a few minutes. So send us your questions and comments, please. On March 10, 2017, WRUU-LP was granted a license by the Federal Communications Commission to serve the public interest as a public trustee until April 1, 2020. Our license will expire on April 1, 2020. We filed an application for a license renewal with the FCC on December 1, 2019. A copy of this application is available for inspection at the FCC website at FCC.gov. Contains information about the station's uh, performance about to come back. since the station's license 30 was first granted on March 10, 2017. In addition, the FCC has asked related to our renewal application and to whether this station is operated in the public interest to file comments and petitions with the FCC by March 2, 2020. Further information concerning the FCC's broadcast license renewal process is available from the Federal Communication Commission, Washington, D.C., 20554.www.fcc.gov. And we're back here. Ooh, wow, that's a gravelly voice there. Uh, forgive me. Um, so we're here on Savannah on Film, and I'm your host, Ed Susevich, here with uh, Stephen Yetman. And uh, just a reminder, we're here on WREULP, Savannah, Georgia, 107.5 FM. We are Savannah Soundings Community Radio with Global Soul. And we're also um, broadcasting live around the world on Facebook Live, Savannah on Film, where we're taking questions and comments now. And of course, there's uh, www.wruu.org where you can hear us also. Um, so this may sound out of left field, but let's talk about the cat in the hat. Well, I was just reminded or asked to talk about it. So I'm <laughs> trying to explain this to someone coming to their house trying to alleviate their concerns mm -hmm. um, there's almost no way for me to explain to someone exactly what's going to happen and I can also tell you that there's no way that they're not going to at some point not be overwhelmed by the fact that the entire company has come into their house to film so we sort of try to give it in terms that people can relate to and mm -hmm. a lot of us from growing up are familiar with the cat in the hat story oh, yeah, totally, totally. so the cat in the hat comes to your house and the place is just completely turned upside down and that's kind of what it seems like to a homeowner when we come in. Um, and my insurance is that as the cat and hat is completed, thing one and thing two sort of appear and slowly start putting things back together as we go. Right. And, it, and our process seems to be very akin to that. Uh, but I use that sort of as an analogy, trying to alleviate someone's fears because there's, there's absolutely no way that you can put 100 people in someone's house and have them sort of sit there and... Just go, this is what I was expecting. <laughs> it's, it's never quite what you expect. No. You know. and, and, and unless you've been in film, I've yeah. seen it you know, before, up close and personal, there's no way you can be prepared for such a thing. 
Right, and uh, I think people like that's a brilliant point that that they have a different expectation, you know, um, and of course they want to watch you film it. You know, most times they want to hang around. Yeah, well, so some of the things that uh, that that are part of what I can do is I can bring an experience to someone. So very often, as you know, we were talking about expensive places and and why would someone be involved? Listen, you can have a lot of money, but you can't necessarily get get this experience. Right, and sometimes if your children are the right age, it's really a great thing. Because it's 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 something that you know, as I said, you have all the money in the world, but you can't make this happen. Um, but if you let me in your house, and you know, we we trust the experience, right? Well, um, you know, behind the scenes, let them sit down and watch the monitors, put on a set of headphones, listen to the dialogue, and, and try and make it more of an experience. Because if you have if you have a five million dollar home, I don't know necessarily the producers want me to give you you know all the money in the world. So I got to find this happy medium to uh, to keep you interested, but. Money's not necessarily interest. You already have the money that you need, so it's about creating this experience that uh, that may be a once in a lifetime thing for you. And it, it's always putting it back better than the way you found it, right? Sure. Oh, not in that, and uh, and and keeping your promise. And keeping your promises. You know? that's, that's a big thing. Right? So the one thing I love about being in the South is is, is you create a reputation, and uh, once you kind of get there, um, you can make handshake deals with people, and there are you know you honor those things, and as do I. You take them very serious. Is it fair to say we're we're a little bit more accommodating here in the South? Yeah, um, but but again, I you'll I, get some sweet tea out of the out of the sure. Here, let me we well, just made some sweet tea. <laughs> here you go. <laughs> so I've done you know most of my filming has been done in Charleston um, and and in the Southeast for that matter. Mm-hmm. Um, but the South is just a, a unique place. It's 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 a great place to be. As you know, we talked about earlier. And I'm, I'm a Southerner by choice, <laughs> right. uh, not by birth. Um, but I I really enjoy being in the South because. If you and I were to agree to something, we shake hands. We both understand right. what's going to happen. Right? Only with his bond. Yeah. Correct. Right. And uh, it's not until that bond is broken that you have to worry about anything. Right. And um, you know, I've been doing the, I've been doing location work for twenty five years, and I can pick up the phone and call three dozen people to pick up the phone and vouch for me. You know, and that's, and, that, that and that's a lot. Sure. The integrity and sure. of what you do. Mm-hmm. If you if tomorrow you couldn't be in a film. <laughs> what would I do? I, what would you do? What, I, what would be the other road trip? There were two. I, I don't know. So hey, this is very yeah. interesting. I've I've never wanted to be in film. Really? Yeah. So people always ask but, me. But how film I wanted it. you in it. Somehow, yeah. uh, I tell people I got into kicking and screaming. I had a friend who used to do what I do, mm-hmm. and I used to ride around with him a good bit. Um, and he worked on several projects. And uh, you should really, you know, I, I just didn't want I didn't want to do any of them. But um, I was selling insurance at the time. This is back in what, 1989. The Hurricane Hugo with Miss Savannah hit Charleston yeah, head on. I, re- I remember. And so there wasn't much to do. People were just trying to put their houses back together and just get their, their lives back in order. And no one was selling No one was selling anything to anybody. Certainly not insurance, not financial products. It was what I was selling at the time. So um, this same friend of mine uh, was doing the uh, Post Storm State Farm commercial. Oh, wow. And that was the first project I worked on. At the time, I was selling insurance for uh, for the French. So, what was that experience like? So that well, that was not uh, the greatest experience as well because uh, it was a probably a three or four day shoot, and two days into it, they had realized there was a problem with the camera, mm-hmm. and the the footage for the first two days went off and on. So not only we have to pick up what we needed to do, we had to go back and capture what we captured the first two days, in the in the last two days of film. It's ne- it's never the same. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's not. It's always really different. Yeah. Um, um, so, what are like some most unusual locations you? What's like the most unusual location? So, I did a movie called uh, Chill Factor mm-hmm. uh, twenty some odd years ago, okay. and um, we were in the upstate of uh, South Carolina, going into the the belly of a power plant. So um, Duke Power created something called uh, the Bad Creek Facility, and so uh, they yeah, have that sounds like a horror movie. Though. Yeah, so they have uh, they, they have a power plant. I guess it's a nuclear plant, and it, mm-hmm. it's more like your your electric stove. You turn it on, it takes a little bit to heat it up, right? Mm-hmm. And then when you go to turn it off, it sort of takes a while to cool down. I'm kind of like that as I get older. <laughs> so so monetarily, it's inefficient. Yeah. Right. So uh, they they built a lake above Lake Jocassee, and they fill it with water. And so what they do is they flatline the power plant mm-hmm. at like 80% power. And during the day, they take this water from this upper creek and dam they built and put that through the, the hydro turbines and create the additional power. And at night, when power is used at its less, 
they take that power that's running they pump the water back up to the tunnel it's been a billion dollars to do this wow. so we were actually using the tunnels beneath the power plant for uh, whatever the scene was in in chill factor at the end of it there was a giant explosion that came out the tunnel mouth and um, it, it was an interesting uh, experience wow. well, that that's a good that's a good story there um, Let's talk about Council of Dads, which is premiering March 10th, um, just around the corner on NBC. I'm very excited um, for this. I mean, this town's on fire um, about this show, and it's going to follow This uh, This Is Us Mm -hmm. on NBC. Um, What is so unique? Okay, you're trying to sell me the show. Mm -hmm. Tell me what's so important about Cancel Dads. Why do I need to watch this show? Well, so it's got a great storyline. You know, it's positive. So, you know, Savannah has had, as you know, many great projects from, you know, Forrest Gump, Midnight, yeah. right? But the whole aftermath of Midnight created this whole genre of people who wanted to come to the cemeteries here in Savannah. Right. Yeah, and Savannah has so much more to offer, but right. you know, it was a way to get people here in town. So that was a good thing. So Council of Dads is, is, a, is, a, is, a, is a current story. That touches on all the uh, current points and um, with, with a good good plot to it. So the story is a dad mm-hmm. uh, has been diagnosed with cancer, and he and his wife are worried about what's going to happen with. He's about to get that call to find out a year later whether or not it's in remission or not. And in this moment, they begin a conversation about him him being worried about you know getting the bad diagnosis, and so they uh, somehow. They come to an agreement, not necessarily trying to come to an agreement, but come to an agreement that they're going to pick some people to try and help them out. And uh, so it's a story about you know family and about relationships and about how people help other people out. And so it's got a great, it's got a great plot to it. And it's and the actual story is based in Savannah. Bruce. It was written by uh, Bruce Filer, who is a, a local Savannian. Mm-hmm. Um, he has taken a little bit of liberties because I believe Bruce did have cancer at some point in time in his life. Um, in our story, I don't give away the, the storyline, but yeah, yeah, don't give away. But Bruce much. lived, and uh, and and today is a uh, very fine man. I've met a couple of times, and he's very proud of his story, which he should be. And uh, we're we're happy to sort of bring it to the screen, the small screen, mm-hmm. uh, but featuring Savannah as a character. So as a character, I mean, we've seen Savannah on film, mm-hmm. or not, not Savannah on film, <laughs> my show, but um, we've seen Savannah in the in films and and now on TV. Um, how, what did you do to to make it unique and experience? Because, you know, I've seen I've seen like some films. You know, you get a, a rapid succession of them, and you know, there's only so many times you're going to see the film, or you're going to see this or that. How do how do you how do you make it new? How did you make it different? Well, uh, I, I think first of all, um, Sven has a lot to offer, right? And a lot of places that that people haven't seen necessarily on film. Uh, downtown's vibrant. There, there, there are historic places that uh, that are that are very much, you know, say Savannah when you see them. Mm-hmm. Um, the river's great. The downtown area is great. Go to little plantation. You know, there are great homes around town. Um, and it's just trying to capture the history, but doing it, you know, in a modern storyline. Right. And um, I mean, you, you have a stellar cast on that show, right? I we mean, do, and they're all wonderful people to work with. Um, it's been quite a pleasure to. Uh, not to work with the cast, but the crew here in town. This is my uh, fourth project here in Savannah in the last two and a half years. Um, we're considering possibly relocating. Uh, that happens a lot. Out. You get that. You get that. Savannah. Savannah is a place that either you move to it or it stays with you long enough, and it just slowly chips away until it says, "Come on, come on back home." Well, for me, um, coming to Savannah to film is uh, is rewarding because the city really tries to help. Uh, I don't want to talk bad about where I live, but there, mm-hmm. I would describe Savannah as uh, film friendly, and uh, and at Charleston, where I'd say it's more film tolerant. Oh, okay. And those are two vastly different things in the world in which I operate. And then in Brooklyn, it's kind of like I'm walking <laughs> here. <laughs> <laughs> I believe New York City has come around to be very helpful Definitely. as well. My daughter tells me. Uh, so, for those who don't know, my youngest, my younger daughter, I have two. Uh, uh, left uh, Charleston uh, a couple years ago to attend school in, in Brooklyn, New York, where I grew up, mm-hmm. which I ironically 30 years ago, I left Brooklyn how, how to uh, go to school that? yeah, in awesome. Charleston, South I mean, that, But that, so she's been in Brooklyn and be, she's seen signs for uh, Madam Secretary and apparently the New York City uh, bends over to try to facilitate uh, filming. So uh, I haven't worked in Brooklyn, 
and uh, but I have visited recently yeah. to see my daughter. It's changed a good bit, and, and uh, she really enjoys where she's at, at school. It's isn't it awesome to to kind of see her following in the footsteps? <laughs> I mean, that's all. That's got to be a good thing, right? Sure. That's awesome. Um, do you know what she's planning uh, with her future? I don't. She's uh, you know she's in their engineering school. Oh, okay. And uh, right now she is uh, doing her spring semester in London. Wow. So uh, we're trying to figure out if there's an opportunity for us to go visit. Yeah, yeah, there you go. I have a house in Savannah. I have one in London. Because you're, you're going to need to get to the airport, right? You know? Sure. And then and then, um, then in some of the other side of the pond, as they say. Um, what were some of the cha most challenging locations? Um, were there any challenging ones um, for counselor dads? It was. We we, uh, we were trying to utilize uh, one of the cemeteries here, uh, Bonaventure. Bonaventure. And oh, yeah. we just we just couldn't work it out. The city was city said we could film there. We just couldn't film within the the parameters which they set forth for us. Um, and you know there were there was some disappointment on our side of that, um, but we ended up finding a, a a a good alternative, which I don't think cinematically you could tell the difference. Mm -hmm. um, but aside from that, I don't know that uh, there was anything that we couldn't get uh, the producers of the show uh, what they were what they were looking for. Excellent, excellent. And it's and it's all going to play on your TV screens, everyone's TV screens, uh, starting March tenth on NBC. Um, we don't know yet if we've got a second season coming. Too soon. We don't yet. Yeah, too soon. We'll know. Uh, you know, see how the numbers are. I think we're gonna three of the shows are gonna follow. This is us. Mm -hmm. And then it, it arcs out and we'll move into their time slot. Okay. And if our numbers are maintained or even close, because This Is Us is considered a hit by NBC, right. I would assume that uh, that there'll be a second season. There's a lot of people who like that show. And, sure. And I think they're going to like Cancel My Dad. Well, the interesting thing about This Is Us is that, uh, as you've seen from my resume, I did uh, all the episodes for Army Wives. Oh, yeah. Uh, Sterling Brown, who was on show. This Is Us, was one of the wives on Army Wives. So we'd worked together for seven years. So it's kind of nice. So to it's, have kind, it's kind of nice continuity. to have this show, right? And then somehow I'm involved in the show that's coming right behind it. But isn't that what's great about the film and TV industries? It's like, you know, you have these circles, and sometimes these circles will intertwine, and then some, you know, you'll work with somebody, and then you might not work with them for a couple of years, and then boom, out of the blue, they they just happen to be on what you're on, and sure, and and you have those long lasting relationships that that are just people that um, that you're gonna appreciate coming into your life uh, forever I think um, so uh, hmm we've already talked about I was looking at my notes here about technology and stuff what what haven't we covered about counseling dads that, that you think people need to know is there anything that we haven't talked about related to the show no I you know the, the reception by the city has been, been really great I can imagine it's only going to get better mm -hmm. uh, once people see kind of what the show's about I, I think we'll have a lot more people reaching out to us and wanting to be a part of the project. Um, I know uh, we talk on the show a lot about infrastructure, and mm -hmm. I know there are plans, uh, you know, um, the flight, the direct flight from L.A. to here, <laughs> you know, that's always the number one well, thing the, that comes well, up. The, you know the two things. It, it's, right. it's, 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 it's a stage. It's a sound and, stage. And, and, and a yeah. direct flight, yeah. Right. I mean, grip and electric, they have their own, you know, thing would be great uh, to have our own sound companies. Here, sure. You know, to pick up what you need. Um so, um, you've worked, is it fair to say, all over the world? No. Or, no, not, no not mostly in the Southeast. Mostly in the Southeast, yeah. okay. And, um, so, hmm, how is it, I'm sure each city has its own different flavor. Like Charleston, like you said, is a little different than Savannah. Mm -hmm. You know, it's different in Brooklyn, <laughs> definitely. Um, so, um, how do, how do you, do you, do you find that, well, you've been here long enough, but this is probably not a question you can necessarily answer, but I did have an instructor, an instructor once when I was in film school, and he was from, I think he was from out west or something, um, I, mean, I can't, can't remember where exactly he was from, um, but he, he said, you know, when I talk to people here in the south, I have to talk a little differently, I can't be as abrupt, you know, when people like, from the north, they may talk a little bit more um, direct, <laughs> In the South, you kind of have to, I don't know, throw a y'all in there or something, or, you know, just, it's like the tone. Um, but you, you've been down here long enough, you probably don't really see that as much. Well, I, I know what you're, 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 you're yeah. getting at here. Yeah. Uh, people come from the Northeast or, or, or out in L.A., and they just right. think that people are, 
waiting around here for them to, to ask whatever it is and, and for the next moment to jump right on it. Yeah. And uh, I think the thing that, uh, that, uh, that that is challenging for me is trying to convince people that. So, so I, I work in an interesting place where I work in the film, film world, mm -hmm. but I also work in the real world. Okay. Right? As opposed to, so when I get a set set up, the director shows up, the director of photography, and everything's been turned back to whatever it's supposed to be, and it's a set, and boom, they go on it. Uh, but it's not them inter interacting with the city and interacting with the police department, working the fire department, and all these different things. So I work in a world where uh, it's where reality and fantasy sort of meet. Okay. Whereas the people that once they shut it up, they just sort of show up in a fantasy, fantasy world. Right. right. The set's set. You know, the, the cars are gone. Everything's set where they need to go. And so it, it's a challenge to to have people realize that. People aren't just sitting around waiting for, for me to make a phone call and, and have them jump on it. People want to tell you their history <laughs> here, here in the South. We want, we want you to know our history. And well, and, and listen, I will yeah. tell you this. I could probably get the shirt uh, off the back of any Southerner that I've ever met. Mm -hmm. If you, you ask them nicely and have a reason for it, and you, you're respectful to people. I mean, that's really what it comes down to. Yeah. Um, I mean, for what I do, I'm asking for someone to help me. Yeah. Right? And, uh, <laughs> excuse me, pardon me. Um, so, uh, what what advice would you give people that are coming up in locations at different different areas of the film industry? I mean, you've done a lot, so the film and TV industry. What would be advice that you would give? Um, I would I would advise people to try and work in different departments. Um, you know, everybody wants to start at a certain spot. But everybody thinks they're a director. Sure. Out of, um, um, but it, but I will tell you this: it's always it's better to start at the bottom. You you never have an appreciation for what you're asking people to do. Unless you've done it, sure. Um, and so I don't want to pick on on film students or anybody no, else. No, no. But uh, you know the best thing to do is to be a PA and work in production and and maybe work in locations, work in the art department. That way, when you be, finally become the director or whatever it is you're looking for right. or wanting to be, then you know you're asking of people and what they do. Okay. Um, what would you like to say about the locations crew you work with here on on Cats and Dads? Here. Um, yeah. Uh, yeah, they were fabulous. Um, it would be, I'm sure my, my friends and the folks I work with in Charleston would be disappointed here, but mm -hmm. I think I put together probably the best group of uh, people that I've ever worked with. Um, they're very good. They're very, very uh, professional. Uh, you know, the thing about, as I told you, I was never really interested in being in film business. What I do bring to it is, is a passion. And um, I, I think that most of my guys um, feed off uh, the passion that I have for what I do. And I've just brought that to the film business as opposed to yeah. the other way around. I've got some of the, I've looked on Facebook Live and seen some of uh, locations people on there um, um, saying it was great to work with you and all that. So that that's that's really uh, good to see. Um, gosh, uh, there's so much more we could talk about, but uh, we're, get, we're, we're getting to a wrap up uh, here on the show. Um, what are... Um, what are some mistakes, and I hate the word mistake, because I think everything is something to be learned. Everything's a challenge to, you know, but what's something early on, or, or has there been something early on in your career that if you could go back and tell yourself, you know, 20, 30 years ago, would you do things differently? Or I might have gotten the film business earlier. You would have gotten the film. <laughs> yeah, I, I feel like I'm 20 years too late to mm -hmm. with, with the technology. It, I feel like I would have been... So much better, <laughs> you know. Well, I will tell you this. So the interesting thing about what I did before I got into the film business, I was selling, as I said, insurance and financial right. products, where the uh, the rejection rate is like 97%. Yeah. Uh, I think the rejection rate in the film business probably runs around five. <laughs> <There's> <laughs> so, it, it, so it's very funny. So I went for a place yeah. where you get this rejection all the time for people trying to be part of what you're doing. And so I, I would say that, uh, I don't know that I changed what I went through, but sort of... Right. Going through that to then make me better appreciate, you know, what I moved into. Yeah, because I mean, if you could go back and change things, it, it would. Well, it depends on what kind of uh, time travel you believe in, you know. Uh, but uh, it would just change too much. I mean, I, I don't regret a thing. You know, I, I look at I look at what are perceived as failures as just uh, reasons to learn. You know, points of interest, points in time, and say, okay. Don't do that. Do it differently. Right. Do it better. But we're, you know, but you know, we're all the sum of our experiences. True. True. Right. True. You know, everything has brought us to this point. Mm -hmm. And uh, you know, 
if you don't fail, it's it's those early films. It's those those first things you work on that, you know, sometimes early in, in a career, and that can be said beyond the film industry, but, you know, you, you, people are, you make those mistakes, and, you know, you hopefully you make them early on and you never repeat them. And you're well, on. the other thing I would, I would say, too, is, is, is it's also, it's important to watch what other people do and potentially learn from their failures. So you don't always have to make the same mistake you watch someone else make. Right. To learn the same thing, and and I can totally agree with you on you know being in different departments uh, within a production because you do learn, you do learn. Mm -hmm. Even if you're a PA, there's there is no shame in that game whatsoever because you're gonna learn, you're gonna learn just by seeing, just by absorbing. You're there, you're gonna osmosis whatever it is. You sure, know, you're, you're gonna you're gonna become a better professional for what you've gone through and. Um, and those experiences and those failures, because what we perceive as failures are just, you know, no, they're stepping stones along the way. They're stepping stones sure. along the way. That's that's a beautiful way to put it. Um, well, we've got to run. Um, I can't say enough thanks uh, to Stephen Yetman, and he's on um, LinkedIn, also on IMDb. So if he comes knocking at your door, there we go. That's my effects department right there. <laughs> um, but if he comes knocking on your door, you want to use your your house is a location. You might want to let it know because <laughs> you might be on the the next uh, number one show on television, and hopefully that's what we're going to see out of uh, Council of Dads. Um, the trailer looks fantastic uh, that they cut together so far. It mm -hmm. just looks like everything that because I monitor a lot of uh, the social media and stuff uh, throughout the film industry here, and um, I've heard a lot of positive um, ness around. Council of Dads, and um, I know a lot of people who have worked on the show. I actually got to do a day of uh, when we were filming. I don't know if I can say this. Mm -hmm. We were filming a location. It's a restaurant. It has something to do with the word crab in it. <laughs> um, but um, I'll let you figure that out. But uh, I, someone, a friend of mine, convinced me to um, to just be a background actor. And I'd never been on that side of the camera. And I was like, I don't want to do that. Why? Why? And I was like, okay, I'll do it. And then I came out of that day, what, 10, 10 hours later or whatever it was, and had a fantastic experience. Mm -hmm. And um, it was good to see, like you said, to see that other side of things. So um, every, every, every chance in life is an opportunity, and we've got to know when to take those opportunities. And I want to thank you for the opportunity of spreading your knowledge, your expertise, your years in the business, and hopefully many more, uh, or wherever life takes you, right? Um, to uh, you, Stephen Yetman. Thank you for being here. Um, don't forget to check out um, Council of Dads, March 10th on NBC. That's when it's going to be coming out, so you'll be able to check that out. And uh, thank you once again for being on the show. Thank and you, Ray. Thank you. And uh, we'll see you later. Thank you, everybody, who um, was on Facebook Live. And uh, this is Savannah on Film. And uh, we'll see you later. Alright, thanks everybody. <laughs>